Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Haig and a very warm welcome to those of you who have joined this webinar this afternoon or this evening wherever you're located because we know that we've got guests on the webinar from the US which is the principal area where the uh, most of the people are who are listening and also from Europe. So I, I by the way I'm speaking from Manchester in England and I am a market researcher that's what I've done all my life. Um, I spent my life uh, looking at both consumer and business to business markets and in so doing have become fascinated by the subject of brand and the effect it has on causing people to buy particular products and that's what I want to talk to you about uh, today. It's quite a challenge because I do believe as we will discuss as we go through this that what you do need in order to build a good brand is, is time. It's like a good stew. It needs to sit um, on the boiler for a long time in order to build that brand. And I want to share with you in 20 minutes 10 tips that I think will make a good brand. This is the first of the tips. And although it may seem a fairly obvious one, uh, as a market researcher, I know from experience that there are many things that we don't know about our customers and much more that we would like to know and some of them are fairly obvious such as who is buying um, what products what are they buying who are they buying them from how they choose those suppliers and of course uh, why they look to do so and we, we might have a very good idea or a reasonable idea as to some of the answers to some of those questions from our customers but we're also interested when building a leading brand in understanding what is motivating potential customers what do they really think so understanding the basics is something that we we usually do that there are two questions that if I could wave a magic wand I'd really like to know the answer to and that is why do my customers really buy my products or my services uh, and the, the reason I would like to know, really know that is because when I buy some products, I really aren't totally sure all the time why I've chosen the car that I drive or I pick up some of the products which I sometimes do by habit in the supermarket. So understanding what really motivates people to buy products is an answer that I'd like to know, the, the, the question I'd like to know the answer to. And of course, I'd also like to know why potential customers are not buying my products. So understanding our customers is tip number one. Tip number two is a fairly obvious one and now we're getting into the meat of what makes a good brand. In, in order to have a leading brand we have to have um, a good front of mind position. Our minds are like shelf spaces and they get crowded, they like discs that get overloaded and when we're thinking about different brands then and I was to ask you to name a couple of brands or three brands in an area that you're familiar with, you soon begin to run dry thinking about those brands, brands after you've mentioned uh, two, three or four brands. So what we're particularly interested in is that spontaneous recall of brands, the front of mind brands. And in building that awareness, we have, depending on whether we're selling consumer products or industrial goods, we have a mix of different sorts of promotions available to us. Um, that, that's shown at the bottom of the screen here, and you can see that if you're selling consumer goods, the likelihood is that you're going to have a significant proportion of your communications budget that's spent on advertising, above the line advertising, and you might be done doing some PR, I'm sure you will, as well as sales promotion. And face to face, personal selling is likely to be less important to you than if you were selling industrial goods where your biggest part of the budget in terms of communications could be your sales force. But you will also most likely be using sales promotion, PR and advertising. So getting our brand to be front of mind, top of mind is going to require some sort of expenditure and we'll have a different promotional mix depending on whether we're selling consumer goods or industrial goods. The third of the tips on building a leading brand is to push your unique selling proposition. Um, we live in a world which is overcrowded with brands and people are hit by a whole range of promotional messages and what we do need is something that will cut through all this noise and have an impact on people. And I like the term 
USB unique selling proposition. And it's uh, it's been overtaken a little bit in uh, marketing jargon by the term com customer value proposition. The thing about a customer value proposition is it usually involves a lot of different attributes. In other words, we make a list of all the things that we think our customers value. But the difference from a USP is the USP is something that is special, uh, hopefully uh, pertinent and valuable to our target audience. And it simplifies the offer in our customers and potential customers' minds. What we do need is a unique selling proposition that we can make to be our high ground, something that uh, other of our competitors do not have. And that means that we need to understand what the values are that our customer base and potential customer base really are looking for. Do we know those? And, and that, of course, links back to tip number one, which is understanding our customers. Tip number four is to provide a solution or an experience. There's an old marketing axiom which says, sell them the sizzle, not the steak. And what, what this really means is that a steak or, or a sausage or whatever it is doesn't look very inviting. But when it's cooked, the smell of that steak or the sausage and, uh, of course, the taste of it is what we've really bought the steak for. And so if we're trying to sell the steak, then we ought to be talking about that taste and that smell that people really want from it. And so it should be with our brands that it's what people do with our brands that really makes them appealing to people. Um, the, the word solution is much overused by marketers, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that you go heavy with that word in all your messages. But what I am saying is that you ought to communicate to customers something that will they can see will benefit them. And if it was a business to business product, something that would perhaps help them grow and develop their profit. So that, that means putting our product in a context in, uh, and showing how it would be used. So case studies and testimonials and of course of people uh, grilling their steak at a barbecue would be something that would be appealing. People driving the cars that they drive is more appealing than just seeing the car stood in the showroom. Tip number five, we're very keen on understanding the left and right hand side of the brain. The left hand side of the brain is the logical side of the brain. It's based on rational argument and it does, of course, play a part in causing people to choose a brand, to choose a product. Uh, but the right hand side of the brain, the emotional side of the brain, we believe is extremely important, especially uh, in terms of building a leading brand. When we as market researchers ask people why they choose products, they tell us quite usually that it's about the best product in terms of the quality that they're looking for at the best price and it's available wherever they want to buy it. And they tend to say those things rather than mention the fact that it might be bought for status purposes or because it gives them some sort of emotional buzz. However, we, we do know that people don't leave their emotions at home. And so even in a business to business environment, we do believe that the emotional effect uh, could be as much as 50 percent on brand selection. So understanding that and knowing that is really important in building a leading brand. I mean, one of the reasons we know that that is the case is because when we ask people in our surveys how long they have used a product, they frequently say that they've used, that they will tell us, by the way, that they're buying the product on the basis of good quality price and availability. And when we say, how long have you used, uh, when did you last choose a new product? They might say, well, I've used this product for 10 years. And it's unbelievable that over that period of time, somebody hasn't come along and try to turn their head with a cheaper product, hopefully a better quality product and one that's more available. And it does suggest that relationships and emotions are things that do drive brands. Tip number six, and here we have a quote from Warren Buffett, and that is that we should market and sell on value and not price. Um, it, it's, it's very easy for our salespeople, especially if we're selling business to business products, to, to get hooked on the importance of price. Um, that, that's very often because 
our salespeople are talking to people in procurement who naturally want the conversation to be about price so the the customers can try and extract extract a better price from us however it may be top of the procurement people agenda but other people in a business who are trying to buy those products for technical reasons or for using them in the production might actually uh, believe that there are other values and it's important that we do understand what the value is of our product we back to value here or our services that we can talk about so that we're not just talking about price in experience sales people tend to get dragged into the gutter in the conversation about price and it, there is a danger that over time all brands become commodities because of this pressure from procurement people or from the competition so we do need to market and sell on value and not on price tip number 7 is to focus on your target audience there is somebody once said that segmentation is at the heart of all good marketing and we believe this to be the case so when we sell our products and services we're not selling them to everybody although everybody is of course welcome to buy them but we're targeting particular people people to whom we believe our offer will be very attractive and a major weakness of many companies is that in their desperation to try and sell their product or service to anybody they they fall between the stools and we're far better to decide who we don't want to sell our product to and who we do want to sell our product to when we're trying to build a leading brand so segmentation is absolutely vital in building a leading brand we need to cluster people according to their different needs Tip number eight is about delivering against your, your promise. And th this links to a saying or a definition that you've probably heard before, and that is that a brand is a promise delivered. When, when people are buying brands, they have an expectation of what they want from that brand. And it's critical that it should say what it, it, sh it should do what it says. And we need to keep a close check on people's satisfaction with the product or service. And we as research, of course, do this with simple questions out like, how likely would you be to recommend this brand to a colleague on a scale from zero to 10? And that question on recommendation gives us uh, the net promoter score. We take the people who give a nine or 10 unlikely to recommend and subtract those that give a score of six or below. And we end up with a net promoter score, which tells us whether our product, our offer is delivering against the promise. Um, the, the average, by the way, for companies producing products around the world is about 24% for a net promoter score. So anything more than 30% is an excellent score saying that we are del delivering against that promise and uh, below 20 means that we've probably got work to do. Tip number nine, is to make sure that the, the the brand and all the values of the brand that we believe in are ingrained throughout the company. Um, it's extremely important when producing a brand that everybody within the company actually understands the brand values and talks those values. So for example, it's no good promoting a brand as being a totally reliable brand if the company culture is such that we're late for meetings or deliveries aren't on time. It's no good promoting a brand that's supposed to be a premium and a high quality brand if the sales force are shabbily dressed or, or they don't know their stuff. So uh, what we do need is employees within a company or anybody that's facing the, the, the customers are aligned like iron filings on a magnet all in the same direction. The company culture has to live and breathe the brand. And if we look at the, the final one of my tips, which is to embrace change. We, we live in a world that is, of course, changing rapidly. That's the one certainty that we know. And on my chart here, I'm showing that over, over time, we've had different groups of people who are potential customers or actual customers of ours. So there's the baby boomers who were born just after the war through to 1964. And then we've got Generation X and the Busters. And latterly, we've got millennials coming through. And the, the Generation 
baby boomers are now on their way out. Generation X is certainly important within the buying decision, and so are millennials. And there's going to be yet another generation that will follow these. Now, technology is going to be a huge influence on these people. We, we need to accept that change is with us. And um, a, a brand, just like that sort of, the, the, the word brand comes from the the hot iron, the mark that was seared on the rump of cattle with a hot iron, uh, it, the, the, the brand should be built to last. And building a leading brand needs patience. And uh, I said at the beginning, it's like a good stew. It needs to simmer on the hob for a long time. And get, although we need to embrace change, it will be a mistake to constantly play with the brand, changing its values or messing with the logo in attempt to freshen it up. So one of the things that I, I do think that we must do with our brands is regularly check that the brand is delivering against its promise and if it isn't, to take corrective action. However, the basics of the brand, such as the brand values and what it stands for, um, are likely to be something that we shouldn't be changing on a, a frequent basis. These are things that we should only change gradually and with caution. Now, when I, I began the, the webinar today, I did say that it's going to be short, that we, we promised to deliver it within 20 minutes, and we're almost at that time now. Um, and I'd like to conclude by saying that our brands carry um, with them the reputation of the company. They're arguably one of our biggest assets. Uh, that those of you who are on the webinar who are from consumer companies will know that, and anybody in a business-to-business -business environment uh, will will know that we learn from what our consumer cousins do in branding. They are our biggest assets, and even for many consumer companies, they're not yet capitalized on the balance sheet, even though they are this huge asset. They are one of the most important drivers of decision making, and uh, for all of us who are marketers, it's our responsibility to ensure that we look after them, nurture them, and that we build them. We, we've taken a recording of the webinar, so it will be there for you to reflect on and share with others if you think fit. And for anybody who does have a burning question and wants to stay online for an extra five minutes, uh, be very happy to continue that conversation. And there's a question facility, as you can probably see on the right hand side of your screen. So um, pl please field the question if you have one. And if you haven't, and for those of you who have to dash, thank you very much for listening. So I'm looking to see if I haven't seen any questions, so I'm going to take it that there aren't any. However, if they if you know where B2B International is, you know that my name is Paul Haig. And if you have any questions and would like to email me, I'd be delighted to answer them personally. My email address is Paul H at b2bintonational.com. Um, one, one, somebody's raised a question here, which uh, it would be good to talk about. And so I'll, I'll just read the question out to you. It says, can you speak to the challenge of making a single brand relevant, relevant to several and varied audiences? And I, that's, that's a great question because one of the tips it was the, my tip on segmentation um, is about recognizing these different groups of people that we have as customers. And it, it is possible to have a single brand that's relevant to several and varied audiences. So, for example, I'll, I'll use a consumer example to see if I can get this discussion going. It may be that um, I travel frequently and I like to travel on b both um, uh, legend airlines as well as low cost airlines. And I might travel on those low cost airlines, of course, as a business person, but I might also go on holiday on the same low cost airlines. So uh, the, the, there are two set two audiences here. There's the business audience and there is also the private audience, the holiday maker who is attracted to the low cost airline. And it is because the, the, the offer of that low cost airline does have appeal to both groups. 
It may be, of course, that what we want to do is to, the low cost, by the way, is our unique selling proposition. And it may be that what we want to do to encourage people who are going for our offer to say that in the case of those people who are going on business, we guarantee that we set off and land on time. And for those people who are going on holiday, we might have a slightly different proposition besides the fact that we're low cost which is that, you know, we're a fun airline and we're going to take care of you and it's going, we're going to make the beginning of your holiday something that's very enjoyable. So I do think you can uh, speak to different audiences, uh, varied audiences. I've got a, another question that's come through here is saying, could I advise somebody on how to keep a seasonal brand in the forefront of consumers' minds all the year round? That, that, that is a good question. One of my clients years ago was Lego, uh, the very famous company, of course, that makes plastic building bricks that kids all over sort of sh shed on the carpet. And one of their challenges was, of course, to, to make that seasonal brand, most of which was sold at the Christmas time, something that would be sold throughout the year. And naturally, kids have birthdays, so they do have an opportunity to do that. Interestingly, by the way, what Lego found, we found as well as researchers, is that if they tried to promote their brand at the very season when most people were buying the product, i.e. at Christmas, the effect of that promotion was very much diluted because all the competition was advertising at the same time. And so they came to the conclusion at the time we were working for them that they would be better spending some of their money on promotion throughout uh, the, the other months of the year other than Christmas in order to have that brand front of mind when Christmas came round and not to spend their money at, at Christmas or so much of their money at Christmas when it may get diluted. So, so it is something to think about the product you, you, you're selling. Um, and of course, it does. It, we, we happen to use something that's selling at Christmas there, but you might have other products such as um, well, suntan cream, I guess, which will be used uh, mainly during the summer months. And I suppose that everybody, every company that makes suntan cream might also uh, seek to sell it to people who go skiing or go out at wintertime, you know, for some other purpose. So there may be other opportunities of building seasonal brands throughout the year. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do think that that's, that's the, thank you for those questions, by the way. I do appreciate that and staying on to, to engage in the conversation. If there is a further conversation that you'd like to have, please do contact us at the company and we'd be delighted to drop you a note. And to everybody who is still there, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye.